بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Continuing with our journey through the chapters of the fiqh pertaining to prayer as taken from the book Umdut al-Fiqh the author Imam Ibn Qudam al-Maqdasi rahmatullah alayhi may Allah have mercy upon him we've reached the chapter where the author is talking about Bab al-Imama issues pertaining to one leading a congregational prayer what does this person need to know what are the regulations that need to be present in that person when they lead the prayer so Salatul Jama'ah the congregational prayer is something which is wajib upon men it's obligatory upon the males of this ummah if they are in the vicinity of a masjid where they can head the adhan under normal conditions then they must respond to that prayer in the masjid in the congregation unless they have a valid excuse not to do so so due to the fact that congregation prayer is always wajib it's always obligatory in these situations for the men then of course the ulama the scholars of fiqh the scholars of islamic jurisprudence found it pertinent to mention the issues pertaining to that because without an imam you cannot have the congregational prayer that's we need to know issues pertaining to the imam the author he says he narrates the hadith from Abu Masud al-Badri radiyallahu anhu one of the great companions as quoted by Imam Muslim in his book of hadith his authentic book of hadith so this great companion is known as Abu Masud al-Badri Badr as we know is the famous battle in Islam which had great significance historically in Islamic history so a person is given the title of being a Badri a person of Badr if they attended that battle that's why this companion is known as Abu Masood al-Badri he's given the nickname of the one of the one known as from the group that attended Badr also you can be called al-Badri if you are from the place so it's not just if you attended the battle it's also if you live in the place of Badr then you're also given the name al-Badri so this great companion Abu Masood al-Badri as collected by Imam Muslim, he says that the Prophet ﷺ said, Ya Ummul Qawm aqra'uhum li kitab illahi azza wa jal. That the one that should lead the prayer in congregation is the one that is aqra'uhum li kitab illahi azza wa jal. Aqra'uhum means the one who is most proficient in the recitation of the Quran. It doesn't necessarily mean the one that has memorized the most Quran nor does it necessarily mean that the one who knows the most rulings about the regulations pertaining to the Quran and the prayer however rulings pertaining to the regulations of the Quran and the prayer are extremely important but that's not what is intended here what is intended here is that the one who should lead the congregational prayer the Imam is the one that has the best recitation the one who is able to recite the Quran in the best way in terms of Tajweed the rules of Tajweed, the Ahkam of Tajweed and the makharij al huruf and the way that the letters of the Quran are pronounced so as long as the person is proficient in the rules of the Quran recitation rules and how to pronounce the letters of the Quran properly then this person should be put forward to lead the salah the hadith continues that Abu Musa Abu Mas'ud is mentioning he said فَإِن كَانُوا فِي الْقِرَاءَةِ سَوَاءً if the ones who want to be Imam are equal in the terms of their quality of recitation so what do we do so then the Prophet ﷺ said فَأَعْلَمُهُمْ بِسُنَّةً what you do is if you have a group of people that all want to be the Imam and none of them are backing down then how do we choose they all have equal ability in terms of recitation so the Prophet ﷺ said the next thing you look out in the in, look to the qualities is which one of them has the most knowledge of the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ فَإِن كَانُوا فِي سُنَّةِ سَوَى However, if all of them are also similar and the same in terms of the knowledge of the Sunnah, then you also go to the next one, which is فَأَقْدَمُهُمْ hijratan. Those from amongst them, the one from amongst them who made the migration to the Prophet ﷺ first. And if they are the same in terms of making the migration also, فَإِن كَانُوا فِي الْحِجْرَةِ سَوَى فَأَقْدَمُهُمْ سِلْمًا Then you go to the final determining uh, factor which is that you look to the one who is eldest in age so the first thing you look to you look to the recitation of the Quran if they're the same in that then you look to the Sunnah if they're the same in the knowledge of the Sunnah then you look to the one who made Hijrah first to the Prophet 
If they're the same in that, you look to the one who is the eldest and you give preference to that person. And also continuing the hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, وَلَا يُؤَمَّنَّا رَجُلُ أَرَجُلُ فِي بَيْتِهِ وَلَا فِي سُلْطَانِهِ And a person should not lead one man, a man should not stand as an imam uh, to lead a people in the house of a person. So what this means is if you're in the house of a person and you cannot lead the congregation without the permission of the person who owns that house. Nor can you do that in a place which is controlled by that person. So if you happen to be in the workplace, for example, and the boss of that organization is there and it's time for prayer, you have to seek permission if you want to lead the prayer from the boss of that organization because that is, is his authority. Likewise, it is if you're in the house of a person, you have to seek permission from the house owner if you want to lead the prayer in that person's house. Preference is always given to the house owner or the owner of the organization to lead the prayer as long as they have the ability to recite Surah Al-Fatiha properly. Even if amongst them there is a scholar of Quran, the scholar of the Quran is not given preference. Rather, the person who owns the house or owns the organization is given preference. However, if that person wants to put the scholar forward, which is a good thing to do, to lead the salah, then they can do that and there's no problem whatsoever. The last words of the hadith that we're mentioning, the Prophet ﷺ said, وَلَا يُجْلَسْ عَلَى تِكْرَمَتِهِ إِلَّا بِإِذْنِهِ And also when you go to the house or a place that a person owns, you shouldn't sit in their designated place of sitting without their permission. So sometimes you find that, in, especially in tribal customs, when you go to visit uh, a person in his place of authority or her place of authority, they have a special seating place where they like to sit or it's reserved for certain guests. So you shouldn't, when you go to a house, just sit wherever you think that you want to sit. You don't just plonk yourself down wherever you feel that you want to be. Rather from the Islamic etiquettes is that when you go to a house, you ask the person who owns that house, where would you like me to sit? And this is something which is extremely important for us to learn the Islamic manners. Islamic manners, the more we learn the Islamic manners, the more we beautify ourselves with the Islamic manners, the more harmony there's going to be in society. And the reason I'm concentrating on this side point because we're living in a time now where really and truly hardly people act upon Islamic manners. People number one don't know them and people number two find it uh, are, are very reluctant or very you know slow with regards to implementing the Islamic manners. The more we implement the Islamic manners in our society the more harmony there's going to be because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that created us. He knows our needs more than anybody else. He knows what is best for our interactions with each other. Therefore, if we implement the Islamic manners that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taught us through the Prophet wasallam, then not only does this increase in harmony and peace and tranquility in the society, but we get rewarded for every time that we do those Islamic manners. So when you go to someone's house, especially a man, you shouldn't just sit down without asking, asking permission because it could be that if you sit down in a place, you might be facing the place where the women tend to come out of a particular room so the person doesn't want you to sit there looking at that door he'd like you to sit in a different direction so the more we uh, beautify ourselves with islamic manners the more harmony and the more reward we get from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the hadith narrated by tirmidhi collected by imam tirmidhi the prophet said ma min shay'in athqalu fi mizal al-mu'min yawm al-qiyamati min husn al-khuluq that on the day of judgment there's going to be nothing which is going to be heavier in the scales of the believer in terms of their deeds that are going to be weighed than good character and good behavior. So the more you have good character in terms of how Allah wants you to behave and the more you beautify yourself and adorn yourself with Islamic character, the heavier your scale of good deeds is going to be in the Day of Judgment. And the more we protect ourselves and adorn ourselves with this Islamic character, the less the stench of this uh, satanic behavior will affect us. It's either one or two. Either we protect ourselves and adorn ourselves with Islamic character or in the absence of that, what's going to take its place is going to be satanic influence. So the more we try to learn about the Islamic character, the more beneficial it's going to be for us. So as a recap, what we've mentioned so far, that the one that should lead the person, the one that should lead the prayer is the one that has the most knowledge of reciting the Quran in terms of the ability to recite, in essence, Surah Al-Fatiha. Okay, that's the first thing. And then in general, the Qur'an. If they're equal in their recitation of the Qur'an, then we look to the one who's most knowledgeable in Sunnah. If they're equal in that, we look to the one who made Hijrah first. 
If they're equal in that, we look to the one who is the eldest. And then we mention also that the person shouldn't lead a person in the place of their authority or in the place or where they have a house, in the person's house. The Prophet Sallallahu said to Malik ibn Huwairith wa sahibihi, to Malik ibn Huwairith who came to the Prophet Sallallahu to learn about the rules of Islam, the Prophet Sallallahu said, إِذَا حَدْرَةِ الصَّلَاةِ فَلْيُؤَذِّنْ أَحَدُكُمَا وَلْيُؤَمُّكُمَا أَكْبَرُكُمَا وَكَانَتْ قِرَاءَتُهُمَا مُتَقَارِبًا The Prophet Sallallahu said to this companion, Malik ibn Huwairith, that when the time comes for the Salah, when you go back to your people, and the time comes for the Salah, then one of you should uh, make the adhan and then the one that should lead you in the salah is the eldest of you the eldest of you should lead in the salah and the rest of the narration mentions that they were very similar in their ability to recite so this again is uh, emphasizing the information that we just previously took that if people are who want to lead the prayer are you know, similar in terms of their knowledge uh, then what should be given preference to is preference to the age of the person. Then that person will lead the salah. The author, he says, وَلَا تَصِحُ الصَّلَاةَ خَلْفَ مَنْ صَلَاتُهُ فَاسِدًا And it's obviously, the author is saying that it's obviously not allowed to pray behind a person whose prayer is invalid for themselves. So it's not allowed for you to pray behind an imam if you know that the imam, his prayer is going to be invalid. So what does this mean? So for example, if the followers, the ma'mum, they know that the prayer of the imam is invalid, like somehow they know that the imam, he broke his wudu. So maybe they saw the imam come out of the bathroom, but they didn't see the imam whilst they were in the bathroom making wudu. The imam forgot to make wudu, right? Or the imam is intentionally praying in the wrong direction, for example. So these matters are going to cause the salah of the imam to be invalid likewise the salah of the followers to be invalid so in this situation that ma'mum cannot follow the imam also it could be a situation that you know that this particular imam that you've come across who wants to lead the people in salah that this particular imam is one who calls upon the dead for example makes supplication to the dead so this is an incorrect belief which uh, nullifies one's islam in certain situations so in this situation then the imam cannot be followed right so if it's a case, we're saying that if the imam, his prayer is going to be invalid, then you as a follower cannot follow that imam. The author gives an exception now. He says, If it's a situation where the imam, he didn't know that, for example, he had broken his wudu. Let's say, for example, there's a situation where the imam, he comes and he leads the people in prayer. And then once he's finished the prayer, he remembers that, oh my God, I forgot to make wudu after having gone to the bathroom. So whilst he was praying, he had forgotten. And none of the followers behind him knew or realized that the imam didn't have wudu. In this situation, what takes place is that the imam has to repeat the prayer, but not the followers behind him. So in the situation where the imam didn't know that he had broken his wudu or that he didn't have wudu, and nor did the followers know that the imam did not have wudu, in this situation, then the only person that needs to repeat the prayer is the Imam himself, not the followers. And this actually took place uh, among some of the Sahaba, for example, Umar radiallahu anhu, and it can be found in the Musannaf of Ibn Abi Shayba. Okay, this actually took place with Umar radiallahu anhu. Once he prayed, he led the companions in Salah, and then later on he realized that he didn't have the purity that was required to lead the Salah. So he told the people that, uh, so he didn't tell the people to repeat the prayer. Okay, rather he himself only repeated the prayer. The author says, وَلَا تَسِحُ خَلْفَ تَارِكَ رُكْنٍ And it's not allowed to pray behind an imam who leaves out a rukn, leaves out one of the pillars. Okay, so if the imam is unable to stand or to make a ruku, for example, then salah behind that person is not going to be valid. Why? Because the salah of the followers is complete, meaning that they can do all of the arkan, they can do all of the pillars. And the salah of the imam is going to be incomplete in the sense that he's unable to do one of the pillars like standing, or he's unable to prostrate, for example, due to health issues. So in this situation, you're not allowed to have that person as an imam. Because your salah, your prayer is complete, and that person who's leading is incomplete. Now the author gives an exception from this scenario. 
except for the one who is the designated Imam of the local masjid. Okay, so the one who is the designated official Imam of the local masjid. In this situation, if this person is unable to do one of the pillars, you're allowed to pray behind him. So the author says, except for the designated, designated Imam, إِذَا صَلَّ جَالِسًا If this person had to pray sitting down. So the only thing which is overlooked is the inability to stand, not other inabilities. If he cannot uh, prostrate or he cannot uh, bow down in sujood, any of these pillars, other pillars other than standing, then the person is not allowed to pray. So the author is saying, however, if the person is the designated Iman and he cannot stand up, due to sickness, then the person can still be the Imam. But the sickness that is preventing the Imam from standing, like the backache for example, and the Imam has to pray sitting down, this can only be a temporary sickness. It cannot be a permanent situation found in the Imam. So the author is saying the exception to be, uh, the exception to not being allowed to pray behind one who cannot fulfill one of the, the pill, one of the pillars is the exception wherein the Imam is the designated official Imam for the local masjid. In this situation, the local Imam, if he cannot stand due to backache or due to some other health problems, and this health problem is not a long lasting problem, it's not going to last forever, it's only a temporary problem for a few weeks or so, then in this situation, you would pray, you are allowed to pray behind him um, sitting down okay you can pray behind the Imam sitting down like the Imam is sitting down and to sit down behind the Imam in this situation is something which is recommended it's not obligatory it's recommended the author says Illa in qa'iman. however if the Imam starts the prayer standing in a standing position thumma ya'tal, but then he becomes sick then his back gives out for yajlis and then he sits down to continue the prayer فَإِنَّهُمْ يُتِمُّونَ مَعَهُ قِيَامًا So then in this situation, the followers, they have to pray behind the Imam standing. They have to continue praying behind the Imam standing. So if the prayer started standing, and then the Imam, his back gave way, and he, pray, he continued the prayer sitting down, in this situation, the followers that were praying behind the Imam, they have to, as an obligation, continue the prayer behind the Imam whilst he's standing. Why? Because in Sahih Bukhari, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, the great companion, he was praying, leading the, uh, the believers in the Salah as the Imam. And then the Prophet sallallahu came out who was sick. The Prophet sallallahu was sick. He came out and he took over from Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu and he was unable to stand. The Prophet sallallahu prayed while sitting down and the companions behind the Prophet sallallahu they remained standing. Why? because they started the prayer standing. So when you start the prayer standing and the Imam has to sit down, then the followers, they remain standing and they don't sit down. And this is obligatory upon them. The author, he says, وَلَا تَسَحُوا إِمَامَةُ الْمَرْعَةِ It's not permitted for a woman to be the Imam of other men. She can be the Imam for other women, uh, but she cannot be the Imam for men. Why? Because the Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith in Bukhari, as one of the evidences, خَيْرُ صُفُوفُ الرِّجَالِ أَوَّلُهَا وَشَرُّهَا أَخِرُهَا That the best rose for the men is the first of the rose, and the worst of the rose for the men is the last of the rose. وَخَيْرُ صُفُوفُ النِّسَاءَ أَخِرُهَا وَشَرُّهَا أَوَّلُهَا And regarding the women, the best of the rose for the women in the congregation, in the masjid, is the last of the rose. Okay, and the worst of the rose for the women is the front of the rows. Therefore, is the front row. Therefore, if a woman was to lead uh, men in prayer, it means she would be in the front row. And this is making the hadith opposite to what the Prophet sallallahu And sadly, this is something which some deviated Muslims uh, do. They put a woman forward to lead the congregation. And uh, these deviant Muslims, either they do it or it's the non-Muslims that are funding them to do these kind of actions to keep the Muslims having to deal with such strange issues which never before existed in the history of Islam. In the century that we're living, in the time that we're living, the deviants and the non-Muslims are always one after another putting issues upon us to try to confuse the Muslims or to keep us busy having to refute these um, non-authentic issues. So the point being that the woman, she cannot lead the men in the Salah. And how could it be the case that the woman, she's supposed to cover herself? And there she is bending over in situations like that, where are the men going to be looking? 
except at her beauty. So this is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't want to take place. So the woman is not to lead the men where she would be stared at in situations that are not befitting her nobility. The author, he says, وَلَا مَنْ بِهِ سَلَسُ الْبَوْلِ And nor is it allowed for you to pray behind the one who has salas al-bawl. Salas al-bawl is a sickness wherein the urine drops uh, continually come. So what happens for somebody who has continual urine drops, whether it's a man or a woman, what they're supposed to do in this situation is that they wash their private parts before the prayer and then they wrap their private parts up as much as possible, right? So that the urine drops do not get onto the clothing. And then they are allowed to pray the prayer of that time. So in this situation, somebody has this uh, discharge, the urine. Uh, in, in normal situation, it means that you're impure, your wudu will be broken. But due to the sickness, a concession is given that they can wash themselves, the private area, and then they wrap it up and then they are allowed to pray. And the author is telling us that the one who is in this situation is not allowed to lead other people in prayer because the concession for that person to pray is for himself only. It's not allowed for him to be a leader for others in prayer. It's only a concession for himself. The author says also the one who cannot lead people in prayer is Al-Ummi. Al-Ummi generally refers to somebody who cannot read and write. But in the books of fiqh, in the books pertaining to Islamic legislation, it refers to the one who cannot recite Surah Al-Fatiha. That's why the author said, الَّذِي لَا يُحْسِنُ الْفَاتِحَا The one who cannot recite Surah Al-Fatiha in the correct way. أَوْ يُخِلَّ بِحَرْفٍ مِنْهَا أَوْ بِمِثْلِهِمْ إِلَّا بِمِثْلِهِمْ Or the person leaves out some of the letters of Surah Al-Fatiha due to not pronouncing them properly. SubhanAllah, even my local masjid, the Imam, he does this. And it's very surprising that the people don't notice this and don't mention something. When he says Assalamu Alaikum at the end of the Salah, instead of saying the Alif Seen, the Alif Lam, uh, he says Salamu Alaikum, Salamu Alaikum, instead of Assalamu Alaikum. So it's strange that he leaves out these letters. So you find people that they're unable to recite Surah Al-Fatiha properly, okay, for a variety of reasons. And if a person is unable to recite Surah Al-Fatiha, then this person cannot be an Imam, except in a situation where everybody else around that Imam is in the same situation, that they all don't know how to recite Surah Al-Fatiha, so then it doesn't matter which one of them lead the prayer. So leaving off, not having the ability to recite Surah Al-Fatiha means that the person cannot lead the Salah because that means they are not fulfilling a Rukan, they're not fulfilling a pillar of the prayer. And it's imperative that we get ourselves teachers, I think I've mentioned this before, to ensure that we're able to recite Surah Al-Fatiha properly, they will teach us how to recite it properly with the correct tajweed and the correct pronunciation of the letters because Surah Al-Fatiha is the pillar of the prayer. Okay? مَنْ لَمْ يَقْرَأْ بِأُمِّ الْقُرْآنِ فَلَا صَلَاةَ لَهُ The Prophet ﷺ said, whoever doesn't pray with Surah Al-Fatiha, then there is no prayer for that person. So it's imperative to sit with somebody and to learn how to recite Surah Al-Fatiha. The author he says, وَيَجُوزُ الْإِئْتِمَامُ الْمُتَّوَدِّعُ بِالْمُتَّيَمِّمُ بِالْمُتَّيَمِّمُ It's permissible for the one who has wudu to pray behind the one who had to make tayammum. So if somebody is known to be an imam, but for whatever reason the imam came back from a journey and they ran out of water on that journey, maybe, uh, this is the scenario, and the imam that's going to lead the prayer had to make tayammum. Tayammum is the dry ablution, the dry wudu that you make with sand, dust and something similar to that. So the author is saying it's permissible for you to make, to pray behind the one who has made their purification with tayammum. Even though you made your purification in the normal way with water, you made your wudu. So he says that it's allowed for you to pray behind this person. Why? Because we have evidence in the uh, sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, for example the hadith of uh, Amr ibn Yasir who as narrated in by Abu Dawood and Imam Ahmad Amr ibn Yasir radiyallahu anhu he was on a journey and he had a wet dream so he didn't make the ghusl as he's supposed to do because it was so cold it was extremely cold and he was going to harm himself by the water being so cold so instead what he did was he made tayammum and when the companions came back to the Prophet sallallahu after this journey they told the Prophet ﷺ that Amr ibn Yasir, he made tayammum and he led us in prayer. Is this valid for us? So the Prophet ﷺ said to him, why did you do that? And he said, I heard Allah ﷻ saying, وَلَا تَقْتُلُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ كَانَ بِكُمْ رَحِيمًا 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, don't kill yourselves. Very Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is merciful with you. Meaning don't put yourself in a situation where you're going to harm yourself to the extent where you would die. Because Amru, he needed to make ghusl, the ritual bath. But he knew that if he did it in that cold winter night, he would have probably killed himself. So the Prophet ﷺ, when hearing this from Amru, he laughed and he didn't say anything to him. So the Prophet ﷺ didn't tell him off or didn't say that what you had done was wrong, that you led your companions in prayer, though you had tayammum and they had wudu. Okay? But it's better that the one who has wudu leads the people that don't have wudu, that have tayammum. Though it's allowed, as we've just explained. Um, وَالْمُفْتَرِدْ بِالْمُتَنَّفِلِ And it's allowed also for the person to pray behind an imam that is praying nafil. Okay, so you want to pray an obligatory prayer, but the one that you are praying behind is praying a nafil prayer, is praying a supererogatory prayer, a non-obligatory prayer. Why? Because in Bukhari and Muslim we have the hadith of Jabir where he said, كَانَ مُعَادْ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُ يُسَلِّي مَعْنَا نَبِيِّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ إِشَاءَ الْآخَرِ ثُمَّ يَرْجَعِ إِلَىٰ قَوْمِهِ فَيُسَلِّي بِهِمْ تِلْكَ الصَّلَاةِ That the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم uh, It's narrated that Mu'adh uh, Nah, Mu'adh رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُ Used to pray with the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم إشاء And then he would go back to his tribe And he would lead his tribe in prayer Though the ones behind him were going to pray the obligatory prayer so this companion, Mu'ad, has already prayed with the Prophet ﷺ. So when he goes back to his tribe and he leads them in Isha, he's now not praying an obligatory prayer, he's praying a nafil prayer, a supererogatory prayer. But the ones behind him are praying an obligatory prayer. So they have differences between them in intention, right? The intention of the Imam is that he's going to pray a nafil prayer. The intention of the followers is that they're going to pray an obligatory prayer. In this situation, it's allowed according to the opinion of the author. Right? That you can differ in intention. Why? Because this is something that the companion Mu'ad radiallahu anhu used to do whilst the Prophet ﷺ was alive and the Prophet ﷺ would have corrected Mu'ad if this action was incorrect. So somebody might ask you, then how is it that you have another hadith that you mentioned to us many times before in the book of Salah that the Prophet ﷺ said, إِنَّمَا جُعْلَ الْإِمَامْ لِيُؤْتَمَّ بِي فَلَا تَخْتَلِفُ عَلَيْهِ that verily the Imam has been made for you to follow. So do not differ with the Imam. So here you are differing with the Imam. The Imam is praying a nafil and you are praying an obligation. So the reply to this is that it's referring to the outer actions. That don't differ with the Imam with regarding to the outer action. When the Imam goes into a ruku, you should go into a ruku. When the Imam stands up from a ruku, you should stand up from a ruku. It's not referring to the inner action of the intention. So according to our author, the, the difference of the intention is allowed that you can pre pray behind somebody who's intending to pray nafil, whereas you are intending to pray, the obligatory pray. If the one praying behind the imam or praying with the imam is only one person, then they stand on the right of the imam. However, if the person prays on the left of the imam, whilst the right of the Imam is empty, then this prayer is not going to be valid. This is referring to one person with the Imam. Okay, you sh if you're one person with the Imam, you should stand on the right of the Imam. However, if you stood on the left of the Imam, whilst the right is an empty, then your prayer is going to be valid. Or you stand in front of the Imam, your prayer is going to be invalid. Or you stand behind the Imam, okay, then your prayer is going to be invalid also. So this is referring to one person. Okay. Um, with regards to praying alone behind the Imam, uh, it's invalid if you're one person. It's also invalid if it's a whole congregation and you choose to pray behind the congregation whilst there is a space in one of the rows. If there's a space in one of the rows, you should fill that space. You're not allowed to pray behind the rows by yourself. However, if there's an excuse like you cannot find space, the rows are complete, and you had to pray behind the Imam by yourself, then that's allowed. The author he says, إِلَّا أَن تَكُونَ إِمْرَأَةً فَتَقِفُ وَحْدَهَا خَلْفَهُ Also, if, you, if a woman, uh, a mother, a daughter, a sister, uh, a, um, a wife is praying behind uh, the male relative, then she should stand behind the, 
the imam and not next to the imam, right? Like some people make that mistake. The wife, the mother, etc. should pray behind the one, the male that is leading them. Why? Because we have the hadith in Sahih Muslim from Anas radiallahu anhu who said, Salaytu ana wa yateem fi baytina khalfa nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa ummi um sulaym khalfana. That I prayed behind the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and an orphan prayed with me and my mother was behind us when we prayed in our house with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was the imam, then it was the males, okay? And then it was the mother of this great companion, Anas radiallahu anhu. وَإِنْ كَانُوا جَمَعَةً وَقَفُوا خَلْفَهُ However, if there's a group of people that are praying behind the Imam, okay, then they should stand behind the Imam, starting from the right and the left, trying to distribute themselves on the right and the left as equally as possible. فَإِنْ وَقَفُوا عَنْ يَمِينِهِ However, if all of them stood on the right of the Imam, that would be valid. أَوْ عَنْ جَانِبَيْهِ صح. Or they both stood on either side of the Imam, like they stood on the right of the Imam and the left of the Imam, then this would also be correct. Okay. وَإِنْ صَلَّتْ إِمْرَأَةٌ بِالنِّسَاءِ قَامَتْ مَعَهُنَّ وَإِنْ صَلَّتْ إِمْرَأَةٌ بِالنِّسَاءِ قَامَتْ مَعَهُنَّ فِي الصَّفِّ وَسْطًا If a woman is leading other women in the prayer, what she should do is not stand in front of them. It's better for her, it's recommended, it's not forbidden for her to stand in front of them, but it's recommended and more rewardable for her to stand in the middle of the row, in the middle of the front row that she is leading. وَكَذَلْكَ إِمَامُ رِجَالِ الْعُرَاتِ يَقُومُ وَسْطَهُمْ And likewise, this same ruling is given to a situation where the males find themselves in a very horrific, difficult situation that so many Muslims are finding themselves in today. May Allah free them from this situation where they are, they are imprisoned unjustly and they are imprisoned in a state where they don't have their clothes with them. So they have to pray in a state of being unclothed. So in a state like this, what's supposed to happen is that the man who is leading the prayer obviously shouldn't stand in front of them so that everyone could see his uh, nakedness. Rather, he should stand in the middle with them, with the rest of the people that he's leading in the prayer. And this is a horrible situation that does take place. We ask Allah to free the Muslims from such situations. If it happens to be also that men and women are mixed in such a situation, then what would happen is that the men would pray first and the women would face the opposite direction. And then once the men have finished praying, whilst they're facing the opposite direction, whilst they're facing the Qibla, then the women would be behind them in a row and they would do their prayer facing the Qibla. May Allah protect Muslims from such situations. I mean, the author, he said, If you have a situation where the congregation behind the Imam is a mix of men and children, Okay, meaning male children. وَخُنَاثَ nisa, And also hermaphrodites, those people that don't have um, exact genitalia. Genitalia. It's not determined, is this person a man or is this person a woman? There's confusion in their genitalia. Uh, hermaphrodites, I think they're called, right? So if you have, the author is saying, if you have, if you have men and you have children and also you have these hermaphrodites and then also you have women, nisa. تَقَدَّمَ الرِّجَالِ Then the ones that would go forward behind the Imam are the men. ثُمَّ سُبْيَانِ And then the male children. ثُمَّ خُنَاثَ And then it would be the hermaphrodites. ثُمَّ النِّسَاء And the last row would be the row of the women. وَمَنْ كَبَرَ قَبْلَ سَلَامِ الْإِمَامِ The author said, and whoever makes the takbirat al-ihram, the first takbir, before the Imam makes the taslim, before the Imam says, As-salamu alaykum in the prayer, فَقَدْ أَدْرَكَ الْجَمَعَ Whoever in the congregational prayer, joins the congregational prayer so late that he only gets there by the time the Imam is about to say Assalamu Alaikum and he has enough time to say Allahu Akbar, the first takbir, then this person is given the ruling as having caught the congregational prayer. Okay, so the person is having caught the congregational prayer and however the reward won't be the same as those who got there early on and started the prayer from the beginning. The reason they give this ruling in this situation that the person is regarded as having caught the congregational prayer is because the salah is considered as one part. It's not divided into different parts where, where each part is given a specific ruling. So therefore, as long as you can catch a part of the salah with the imam, okay, before he makes the slim, then you are considered as having caught the congregational prayer. So in this situation, the follower 
got to the congregational prayer just before the Imam made the taslim, before he said Asalaamu Alaikum. So he's given the ruling of having caught the congregational prayer. The author says, وَمَنْ أَدْرَكَ الرُّقُوفَ قَدْ أَدْرَكَ الرَّكَعْ وَإِلَّا فَلَا And whoever gets to the Imam in the situation with the Imam is in the Ruku. So he gets to the Imam and joins the Imam in the Ruku before the Imam gets up from the Ruku. Then this person is considered to having caught that unit of prayer, that Raka of prayer. He doesn't have to repeat the Raka. Why? Because he caught the Imam before the Imam got up from the Ruku, got up from the bowing position. So if you get to the Imam in that situation, you don't, and you didn't have enough time to say Subhana Rabbi al Azim, but you know for sure that you caught the Imam in that position of Ruku, then that suffices. Okay, as long as you got to the Imam before he got up from that Ruku, then you're considered as having caught the Ruku and you don't have to complete the unit of prayer that is connected to that Ruku. Okay? Otherwise, if you didn't catch that, then you have to repeat the unit in the prayer that you missed. What's the evidence? The evidence is in the hadith in Abi Dawood, Man adraka ruku faqad adraka araka. That whoever catches the ruku with the imam, then he has caught the raka, then he has caught the unit of the prayer. Okay? Um, and also needed to mention that pertaining to this point, uh, if you see the Imam in this situation and you're at the masjid door, for example, and the rows are like 10 to 15 meters ahead of you, you shouldn't rush to the extent where you can trip over and you know you, you cause yourself difficulty. Rather, you, you take your time. And that which you catch with the Imam, you pray, and that which you miss, as the Prophet ﷺ said, you make up in a, in a way or in a tranquil manner. You shouldn't rush to the uh, congregation. The only time you're allowed to rush to the congregation really and truly, if you are late, is if you know that you can get there before the Imam is uh, making the first takbir. Because the first takbir it has a lot of virtue uh, in Islam. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we'll stop here.